quick disclaimer. Opinions of host and guest do not represent the views or opinions of functional movement systems. Always consult your physician before beginning any exercise program. This general information is not intended to replace your healthcare professional. Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let's preview what's coming up in this episode. Pain wants to stop you. Pain says you can't. Advil says you can. Oh, Sally, what happened? Strain my back. I know what'll help. Don't pills. Good advice. When the pain keeps growing, but you gotta keep going. For years, advertising has told us, don't let pain hold you back. We quickly reach for meds and gimmicks to get us through our day, but are we causing more harm than good? On this episode, we discuss pain management. We explore how we deal with discomfort and ways to find the root of the issue. We cover acute versus chronic pain, inflammatory foods, behavior modification, and give some ideas on how to get pain cleared up and get you moving well. So let's get going with this episode of the Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. You know, Gray, I typically feel pretty good. I mean, I work out a little bit. I'm pretty active, you know. Um, you have a fairly low-stress job. I have a <laughs> yeah. the, the biggest part of my job that's stressful is dealing with you. Everything we saw else, an email from Lily last week. Y'all got to wash your friggin' dishes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, exactly. And then he goes up to D.C. and meets with a lobbyist. I'm like, you had to do both those things yeah. in the same week. Yeah, that, that doesn't bother me. <laughs> but uh, about, I don't know, it's probably three weeks ago, my toe just started hurting like crazy. I'm like, what the hell? You know, I got a PhD. I feel like I can know what I'm doing. You I, work I, through this on your I own, can, are you? I can figure this out. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, I don't remember dropping anything on it. I don't know what happened. I was like, it can't be gout. Gout is an old man's <laughs> problem. It's like, it can't be gout. <laughs> I got a golf tournament. Yeah, it'd be all right in a couple of days. I'll throw some Advil in me and see how I can do And I don't really, I'm not a good golfer. But this one tournament that I play in every year, I have a chance because they take your handicap. And I got a high handicap, so that's a good thing. Okay. But I got this toe problem going on, and it's hurting like crazy. Which toe is it, Lee? It's my right big toe. Classic gout. Uric acid. <laughs> yeah. He's drinking bourbon, eating a lobster tail, wondering where well, the gout's you know, from. Well, you know, it's during the summer. You know, I've, I've, I've got, got, the, got the lake thing going, so I'm probably partaking a little bit more than normal. Anyway, so lo and behold, I go play in the golf tournament, and lo and behold, I play bad, and lo and behold, my back starts hurting. So the common thing I do, probably what most people do, I try to pop some Advil, self-diagnose, go out and do probably more than I should, Mm -hmm. and you know what it does? None of it helps. (laughs) (laughs) So, and I start, you know, of course it turns out to be gout, I get the medication, it's fine, I'm, I'm, I'm fine now, but again... Eat some salads. I for, I forgot. No, red meat is. <laughs> it doesn't red meat and alcohol help gout? So steak salad? You're saying steak? <laughs> so one, I realized that I am an old man. Yeah. I'm right in that demographic. That yeah, makes <laughs> so, me worse than that. Yeah. So this whole idea about pain, pain is there telling you something is wrong. Something is going on that if you don't deal with it, something else is going to happen. And again, just like you know, just like we've been saying for 20 years. I had pain in my toe, but a bigger problem started to be my back. Mm -hmm. Because you were walking. Well, you were probably riding more than you were, but you were swinging. You were, yeah. Well, you know, think about this. Since you started watching TV, whether it was BC powders when you were a kid or ibuprofen and Aleve when you're an adult, you are told every day in every media channel you get, don't you let this pain inhibit your goals and what you're doing. Meanwhile, a guy named Aristotle said pain is life's greatest teacher, meaning when you're in pain, before you go and cover it up, why don't you ask yourself, am I broken or are my behaviors breaking me? And when you answer those questions honestly, you'll find out 80% of the time your freaking behaviors are what's getting ready to break your parts. But it's real easy to blame it on your knee arthritis. But look at 
12 years of bad behavior with respect to glute activation, ankle mobility, and gait that have been you know, tearing up that knee. But the media will tell you this pain is an inconvenience and covered up. Nobody ever tells you to ignore the red light on your dashboard that says your car's overheating. Just, you know, you could just, just put a you know, postage stamp right over that little light and you'll never see it again. Nobody ever says that because we know when our computer is getting ready to crash or our car's getting ready to crash, we need to do something. We need to change the way we're handling and taking care of this. But don't you let that pain sideline. You know, I was watching it the other day when, uh, and, and it was this guy, he woke up and he's rubbing his knee and he put on his knee brace, he popped to a leave, next thing you know, he's playing tennis. And I'm like, it, it almost becomes a thing where I talk to old football coaches, it's vitamin I. You know, people actually start taking ibuprofen like you would a daily vitamin D or C tablet. And I even met one of my friends in the parking lot who did that for six years and then fell down one day on the job with a bleeding ulcer. Mm-hmm. And the ulcer was causing a problem. Now, he was trying to avoid getting a total knee and wound up getting a total knee. But he nearly bled to death internally because what became a temporary convenience maneuver started becoming a daily regime. I've had probably no less than six patients over my career have a bleeding ulcer from chronic use of anti-inflammatories, almost treating it like a supplement not a cover-up. And we do need to listen to the pain we're having. And yes, it can be inconvenient at some time, but you had a lot of warnings before it got this bad. You just didn't want to listen to them. So today's conversation is obviously around pain. Um, But before we get any deeper, like what, what's the best way that you can find to define what is pain? I I would say, I, I think, I don't think anybody listening and, and even you get to younger kids, do you say, does it hurt? Everybody knows what pain is. Right. It's just, you know, I think what is difficult is judging the interpretation of what pain is. Meaning what Gray thinks is hurt hurts may not be what I think hurts. So my pain and Gray's pain is different. And it doesn't really matter that it's different. What matters is that you have recognized that something is wrong in your body. Right. Because that's the point, right? Pain is there telling you something is wrong. Whether you have gout or you drop something on your toe, that's your body's natural, normal signal telling you that something's not normal. And I think, you know, I think, you know, people trying to judge what, you know, well, is he just a wuss or is he, (laughs) you know, what? It doesn't matter. Right. If you think it hurts, because I've dealt with athletes that someone's walked in and their ankle is 10 times the size of the other one, and they're walking in like it doesn't hurt. Very next athlete walks in, same looking ankle, they can't put any weight on it. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. But they both have a level of pain that, that is there telling you something's going on. So I think it's difficult to say, it's, it's, I think we all understand what pain is. It's more difficult to understand what is how it's different between each individual. Well, right now, I think the biggest disappointment in healthcare is when you have pain, surgery and medication are conversations you start having very, very quickly. Neither of these are what I would consider a true differential diagnosis. And when we were in the early days of developing the SFMA, I'd been a physical therapist for a while. We'd been doing functional movements during the exam, but Ashley, you could come in the clinic and say, my shoulder hurts when I reach behind my back at the level of my bra strap, something like that. So you would reproduce that movement. We would immediately narrow down on the shoulder and start doing things. When we were in the early days of the SFMA, I said, I wish I just had seven movements that we could run across you. I know some are going to hurt, but I also know some aren't going to hurt. How many things can your shoulder do that still don't hurt? Mm -hmm. Does everything you do with your shoulder hurt? And how many other things are going on? Lee had low back pain. He was, <laughs> he caused it by playing on, on the bad toe. So when we mapped out the SFMA, we said, patients walk in knowing where it hurts. They won't tell you what they can't do, and they won't tell you what doesn't hurt. But when we get through the top tier of the SFMA, we actually have some really bad movement patterns that aren't altered by pain. And we have an opportunity to check these and see if they'll modulate your pain or not. But 
when when pain and movement are in play, when your physical musculoskeletal system and some of the movements you do cause pain, prior to the SFMA, I really wasn't satisfied with a good mapping of that. Now, the the Maitland manual therapy and the McKenzie manual therapy had sort of ways they wanted to define pain. Shirley Sarman tries to define pain, but nobody's ever put it up against a movement map and said, these are dysfunctional, non-painful movements. These are functional, painful movements, you know, and done that. And I did it more for myself than I did it for the world. It made me a better, better therapist the very next day. Took about an extra five minutes. I could handle it. But even if we'd never published on that, I wouldn't be doing anything different to this day. And I honestly think if you're drawn into these pain conversations, you got to realize you're getting ready to base a lot of your decisions on a symptom. And to be a medical professional and to treat you just like I'd like somebody to treat my mom, I've got to have way more signs wrapped around your symptom so I can make objective things. Because just like Lee just said, two people with the exact same problem are going to express it two different ways. If I'm going for some opioids right now, I'm going to tell you my pain's this bad. If I'm stoic and don't believe in drugs, I'll tell you it's manageable. I'm telling you what you want to hear. You skin your knee bad enough, you get a piece of cake. Okay, here we go. So we've got a lot of altered behavior around pain. The second thing is... uh, Life is a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. You don't have to call that pain. That Sometimes it's just uncomfortable. You have a hard day at work, you don't need to take an ibuprofen. You could sit in some Epsom salts in the bathtub, or you could just get an extra hour of sleep, and you might want to think maybe dehydration's part of that. We know dehydration's part of a hangover. How many people, you know, take the ibuprofen, but it's the <laughs> half a gallon you drink behind it that's probably helping just as much. So if we know what's causing your pain, do what you have to do. If you're hungover or shoveled snow for two hours and haven't been active this winter, we know where your pain's coming from. But when you're getting into this daily you know, when you're already making decisions and planning your day around your pain, and I can say that from personal experience, I've had quite a few orthopedic problems, I've had to deal with Lyme's disease, I've woken up and actually planned my day around how much pain can I take today. And that's a slippery slope. That can get you in in a pretty bad place really quick. It'll get you out of shape and out of health really quick, and it'll also aim you at some behaviors you don't want to be at too long. So we, we got to all face this uh, at a certain point in your life. Part of what you're talking about, Gray, is, as you go through that is acute versus chronic. Because like, acute, if you're, you know, if you're active, there are going to be some times that you, you know, push yourself too far, go out and play a, a game of basketball, go out and play a round of golf, that whatever it is that you injure yourself, where you have an episode that you can say, that's what caused my, my ankle to hurt. I went up for a layup, rolled my ankle. I was playing tennis, I twisted, and, you know, whatever. That hurt my back. That's acute. Too often, the acute problem will go away, Mm -hmm. but leads to a chronic problem somewhere else. And I think that's what's much more difficult to really map, as you talked about it, with your movements. Because, yeah, I'm coming in because my ankle hurts. I'm going to take my ibuprofen, get the swelling down. Two to three weeks later, my ankle feels okay, but it's not normal. And that ankle problem, lack of motor mobility, lack of motor control, will lead to a chronic issue in your back. And I think that's too often what we're dealing with. What the average person is walking around dealing with is those chronic little aches and pains that we have to map to to really find out what's causing that. Yeah, and and if you are already forward thinking and if you've, you've adopted a more active lifestyle, whether it be through exercise or just labor or whatever you're doing, you do realize if you drive a car more frequently, your routine maintenance schedule goes up, right? If you drive a lot, you're going to change the oil and check the fluids and belts and tires way more often. So there is a proactive responsibility when you're putting more miles on your car, more miles on your computer that you automatically assume. But when you start putting more miles on your body, 
do we start eating right? Do we start sleeping more? Do we start hydrating? Do we start taking that downtime that is all part of that, that recovery cycle? And many times we don't. We just take the exact same friggin' lifestyle, add a third more physical stress, and then all of a sudden think we're going to look good in the mirror by Thursday. No. You're going to be hunched over and making a really ugly face in the mirror because you have added stress without being responsible. What, is the, what does the average person do that in January, Gray? They, they make the New Year's resolution to lose weight and get in shape. So what do they do? They start a diet and start exercising Yep. <laughs> at the same time. I want to drive faster, and I want my car to get better gas mileage at the exact same time that's and possible, then right? a couple of months later, they're having problems. Yep. They're injured. And they think that's normal. You, you needed a good trainer and you're getting ready to meet a physical therapist or chiropractor. <laughs> so. But too often people assume, and, and we have some data that, that we've seen over the years um, in a group of utility workers that 70% felt it was normal to have pain at the end of the day. So most people walking around, one, a good portion of the population is, has some sort of pain. And a lot of people just assume that's just normal. That's the way it's supposed to be. Well, I'm older. These aches and pains are just normal. No, and, and believe it or not, Lee, back when you and I started looking at the different uh, lifestyle metric devices, the watches, the oar rings, I, I was going through some stuff, and it took me about a month, maybe six weeks to correlate some of the painful activities that, that I was going through and trying to be active right up against my night's sleep. And, and there, I've had months where I barely slept five hours and didn't really have a good deep, deep sleep cycle. As soon as I started taking my sleep more serious and doing some of the things that would help me sleep better, I didn't sleep perfect. I just slept better than I was sleeping, okay? All of a sudden, I could honestly say, pain's not as bad today. But it's really easy to brace, treat, medicate, you know, uh, get a manipulation, get dry needle more, when really I had broken that, that, that cycle and I wasn't, taking, I wasn't taking my own advice. I could absolutely see poor recovery in a patient, but I couldn't look in the mirror and see it. And, and I honestly think that, you know, if you're in healthcare, fitness, coaching, whatever, and you're experiencing probably more pain than you think you need, why don't you take the same responsible route that you're going to guide other people down? Because I tell you, and until you see a chef eat his own food, I'm be pretty skeptical. <laughs> really, you know, the chef tastes the food, and I and it it has been refreshing for me. And some of our instructors, we take care of each other. We're on the road. You've been on a plane flight for four hours. We get get each other's neck loosened up, but it really makes you think: Am I repairing something that I could have just maintained a little bit better? if I were proactive. Well, we're 100% proactive at FMS. We're saying fix it before it breaks, but sometimes if you don't do it to yourself, the integrity, the, the enthusiasm just isn't there. The confidence level just isn't there. And so. it's, you're going to have episodes where things break. Right. I mean, that's just normal Lee's life. Lee's going to get gout. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's normal life. It's how you deal with that and understand that the pain is the signal. As you said, it's the symptom that something else is going on. And it's... It's not just up, it's up to everybody, humans, to -hmm. figure out where is the pain coming from. Whether it's an old injury, sprained my ankle 10 years ago, that's the reason my back now hurts because I've got a lack of mobility in that ankle. Is it because you're not getting as much sleep as you need to? Is it because you're not hydrated? You still have to map what's the underlying cause of something that's telling you this area of the body's hurt. This this has been my logic loop all along. If you come in with a certain level of pain in a certain part of your body, and I can find reasonable levels of dysfunction, mobility, stability, movement issues that aren't part of that pain, they're just there, then before I attack the pain, if I can do something measurably speaking, meaning if I make your balance better and all of a sudden your back doesn't hurt as much when I touch those, if I can do something with a, a measurable sign, a reliable sign that affects your pain, I'm going to stay right there. I also, I know how to reduce inflammation. I know how to do this stuff. So I can get you feeling better whether I fix you or not. 
So once you got that skill set, you really got to ask yourself that these questions. But I tell you, if you don't have signs bracketed completely around your patients and clients with pain behavior, before you know it, they'll be running the show. Their symptoms will be running the show. And your empathy and your creativity will help them live around that problem instead of blasting right through it. So that is one thing that, that I think we're all passionate about. Pain's going to happen. And if we can't find hard physical signs associated with that pain that, uh, that we can modulate, then really it's all in your head. Because if I can't find a physical representation of why you're putting extra stress on this body part or why this body part isn't coming around, then I got to get off the case. That, that's happened to me in clinic about five or six times where I was running my movement modulation model. I was trying to run you through an SFMA. And these people were hurting irregardless of the movement patterns I did. And they all were referred and this is a big pet peeve of mine, with low back pain. Low back pain is not a thing. It's a freaking symptom. You went to the doctor and he said, what's wrong? I got low back pain. He goes, oh, okay. And he writes it down on a piece of paper and sends it to somebody else. You paid him $85 to tell you what you told him. <laughs> this is not a diagnosis. This is a syndrome that you're getting lumped into and you're going to see a medication before you see a differential diagnosis because low back pain can come from a lot of different places. My point is, I couldn't reproduce mechanically the pain level or map these people were doing. I got on the phone with their physician, and all five times, this was not musculoskeletal at all. These, these people either were experiencing a tumor or cancer, and none of these people are here with us right now. And I'm glad I didn't waste the last six weeks of their life with freaking hot packs and ultrasound because it didn't fit the movement map that I was committed to because of objective integrity. And so we can sling a lot of palliative modalities at people in pain, but if you can't put the crosshairs on it, don't you dare pull the trigger. So well, I think, I think a lot of what we've, we've talked about until to that last little part there, Gray, is orthopedic and musculoskeletal problems. Mm -hmm. You know, the pain somewhere is probably due to something else, but they do, it doesn't have to be an orthopedic problem. That's what you're getting at. It's pain is either due to some type of orthopedic issue or illness. Yeah. Every be you point on your body is musculoskeletal, yeah. but it could be a kidney stone. It could be, it could be, just like me. My, my, my problem with gout was not musculoskeletal. It was an imbalance in the chemicals in my system, and it just happened to go down to the most distal area. I'm pretty sure there's at least one person in this country that had you in a set of $300 orthotics pretty quick. Right. Before they ever ask you about your diet or how did the pain come about. Exactly. I, I hate now, to say it, but... Well, it's up to me at this point to really regulate and monitor what I'm doing so that doesn't come back. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. Now, could I go take a, should I take some prednisone and, and whatever pills every day? I'm sure that's what a doctor is going to recommend. But now I understand and need to do figure out that it doesn't come back. So it's, it's not just the orthopedic, it's the illness. And the one thing, Gray, we've gotten critiqued over the years from a lot of people is that when we say if a person is in pain, you need to go see a medical professional. It's not that we're worried that a lot of trainers can't handle somebody who's got a shoulder impingement. It's making sure that it's shoulder impingement mm -hmm. and it's not something else. It's not that you uncovered that there may be cancer. It may be, you know, maybe a mental health issue. It could be a cervical. It could be whatever, but you need to understand this is get a definitive diagnosis on what the cause is before you just arbitrarily guess. Yeah, and, and now that I think our language has gotten better, um, what we're really saying is when somebody gets to the point of a daily complaint of pain or activity-based pain, they've already got five or six risk factors that nobody's looking at. And these musculoskeletal risk factors that are now becoming very prevalent line right up with meta metabolic problems. Two things we see as musculoskeletal risk factors pain with movement, and obesity or high BMI. Now, we don't attack pain or obesity. We attack what are the movement problems that are clustered around this, like poor balance, poor flexibility, poor symmetry within very fundamental body movements. And the funny thing is, attacking these movements is all about behavior modification and awareness. Whereas, what happens when one of our parents gets put on hypertensive medication? 
We all know they got things they could do in their lifestyle to not be hypertensive, but that medication gets their numbers right. Is, are they ever coming off that med? Because in a perfect world, that med was a temporary safety mechanism to get their pressures down so they could drop some weight, so they could clean up their diet, so they could do these things. But what happens? Just like the ibuprofen, it becomes part of the daily regime. I don't think hypertensive medication was made to be with you all your life. I don't think type 2 diabetics need insulin the rest of their life. Some of these people need behavior modification and you can give them the, 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 you know, the flotation device, but as soon as you get them to shore, take it away because, or, or have them understand that modifying your behavior gets you to dump this drug and having authentic non-hypertension is way better than having medicated non-hypertension. It just is. And so we lean on healthcare thinking that they're going to come to our rescue. And I honestly think we're sitting on about two generations of Americans that think healthcare is going to take care of you. Well, if you're in a car accident, you got to be on the helicopter or you got appendicitis, it will. If you're having Western diseases, you caused them yourself. You hadn't been listening to the education that's out there all along. And if you're having musculoskeletal problems, you're running your body wrong. And it's up to us to basically uncover these layers of bad physical behavior in ways. And one of the first ones is, you know, GPs now recommend that you should exercise if you fit the demographic of a non-active person, and they leave it at that. That's almost like me saying, you should take prednisone. Well, I don't know how much, and I don't know how often, and I don't know where you're going to get it, but you should take prednisone. I, I don't know any more about it than that, but having somebody who's had no training in exercise and movement and some of these musculoskeletal risk factors recommend exercise, they're not wrong, but they should basically say, you need to walk more. And if you're afraid to walk more or it's painful to walk more, let me get you to a movement specialist so we can get you doing there. End of story. That's it. Otherwise, walk more because... Six weeks of walking more will probably help you work through a lot of the things that we're going to need you to start at, meaning I, I, I meet a lot of people that aren't fit enough to start anything more than supervised exercise today, but they could all walk a little more if it doesn't hurt. So. Well, I mean, there's no secret what the recipe is to live a longer, healthier life. I mean, let, let's look at where we are today, coming out of this pandemic. What is everybody focused on? The vaccine. Get the vaccine, get the vaccine, get the vaccine. The secret to battling COVID is right here in front of us. It's what we know to battling every disease right now, disease for, for the most part, is exercise, movement. Mm -hmm. Get out there and do eat right, exercise, don't smoke. That's the secret. And it is not a secret, right? Battling COVID, that's what, that's what has been coming out. But nobody's talking about it. Well, there's two different kinds of vaccines. The smallpox vaccine is something that you get once and you're good. And take the flu vaccine, for instance. When I was deep into healthcare and working in a string of clinics, I had to get my flu shot every year. When I started writing and lecturing more and I wasn't on the floor, I just said, you know what, I'm going to skip it this year. I got the flu less when I didn't get the vaccine. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm just telling you that some vaccines are chasing their tail and some vaccines are a one and done thing. And you better know which one you're getting. But like Lee said, your insurance policy is not the vaccine. It's the state of readiness and state of health that you bring to the next problem you're going through. And that's what, that's what I think is the central message of the FMS. People are going to get injured. The more active you are and the more exposure you have, the more musculoskeletal problems you're going to have. You just are. Cars with more miles potentially can have more problems. However, if your movement screen is good on your next accident, the chance of you recovering faster and better compared to somebody who had their next accident with a really, really bad movement screen is way better. So the movement screen is not an insurance policy against injury. It's against the extenuating circumstances that you don't have to bring to this next episode. You just don't. And, and people aren't really wanting to think that way. They, they want a guarantee because you get them with blenders and computers and cell phones. There's no guarantee. you got to take care of this thing. You can't turn it in. It's the only body you're getting. You want to improve your kettlebell workouts? Indian clubs may just be the missing link. 
While kettlebells are great at improving strength and power, Indian clubs are great at improving your speed, coordination, balance, and flexibility. Pairing these two can drive positive results across your entire workout. Club swinging is a perfect complement to kettlebell training. When you have compensation and struggle weight training, you often pick up bad form. It's almost impossible to get bad form with Indian clubs because those things either move or they're awkward. In the course, we cover classical moves all the way to advanced moves and even show you how they can be used as correctives in your workout. If you want a greater challenge, check out our clubs course at functionalmovement.com. Get 30% off the FMS Introduction to Indian Clubs online course using promo code CLUBCOURSE. That's promo code CLUBCOURSE for 30% off. Offer valid for a limited time only. What are the risk factors of ignoring pain signals? Pain is there telling you something is wrong, and by ignoring it, <clears throat> one, it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And you have a higher chance of injuring something else in the body. So, okay, my ankle hurts, my back hurts, whatever. Over time, if you just ignore that, pop the Advil and get through it. Because one thing about Advil and a lot of these medications, they work. They will take the pain away, which allows you to do more, thereby putting more stress on another area of the body. So my, my back hurts, but it's because my ankle was the underlying issue before my back started hurting. So now I'm popping... Advil so my back doesn't hurt or my ankle's still screwed up so now lo and behold my knee's starting hurting so it's just it's just going to be in this vicious cycle that you're going to get into and I think you know the one thing Gray that I, I want to make sure that that you and I are kind of saying the same thing is that the ibuprofen isn't the, the the bad guy Advil's not the bad guy medication's not the bad guy it's it's continuing to lean on those things. No different than, you know, you go to a, you go to a 5K or a marathon and 90% of the people are got, you know, half the body's <laughs> covered up with tape, right? Yeah. And you got all these, these, this tape out there now that's holding a lot of these people together. I'm not going to sit there and ta say tape is bad. You know, we did a lot of taping in my former career as an athletic trainer. I taped a lot of people, but the you tape... You know what our criteria was, though? We put a tape, piece of tape on you, your movement screen changed. Right, the I think a lot the, of people are putting tape on them now because it, it blends with their outfit. It has the same color scheme. Right, but the, ta the tape is there, as, you, as your analogy, king of analogies, is the flotation device. The I, Advil is the flotation... So they serve a purpose. The purpose is to get you to a At point. At some point, learn how to swim. <laughs> right. They serve the purpose, and that's to get you, in your analogy, to learn to swim or get you to a shore so you now can do what you need to do to become more durable, to keep yourself out of pain and not lean on the flotation device. Okay, Ashley, and, and to your point, as people experience pain, as people have a pain episode, if you get to the bottom of that, you're positioning yourself for a piece of education. This is where I think healthcare doesn't just close the case, they measure the amount of risk factors that you've got. And they're really easy. Bad movement screens are contributing to your movement risk factors for the future. Bad Y balance test, bad motor control screen, bad grip strength, you know, is doing that. So I see two responses. People learn to be active around the pain. Sometimes people are covering it up. Sometimes people are taping it and strapping it up. But I see another side to that coin. I have watched older individuals in our community have a pain episode, and they just get a smaller life. They just don't do as much. But they, it's such an incremental lessening of their physical life that if you don't see them for about five years, they age about 15 years. And so the two responses I see are reach for another cover-up, reach for another cover-up. I know people that if they don't get a massage every week, they're a wreck. And I'm like, really? Somebody else has to move your tissue around just so you can be comfortable in your own tissue? That's not right. It's just, it's not. So I see people slap a lot of supplements and medications at it, or I see them systematically walk a little bit slower, mm -hmm. take a little bit longer to get out of the car, avoid steps at all costs, take elevators whenever they can. Their life just gets smaller, and then all of a sudden they want to go to Disney World for four days, and they're going to be on a scooter. I hate to say it, but and, and it surprises people that they decline that quickly, and that's why I think there needs to be, just like we let dentists look in our mouth, even though 
we're flossing and brushing, they're still going to find something every now and then. These well physicals that we get, if they don't start having a movement component quick, we're going we're gonna to give a lot of people a pass that they're healthy. And all we're looking at is the same vital signs we came up with 70 years ago. There's new vital signs now. And, and your body's going to tell us uh, a lot about the way you've been treating it if we just shut your mouth and say, stand on one foot, touch your toes, turn to the left, turn to the right. Does this hurt? Can you do this? And your body will tell us exactly how you've been behaving. It's, at some point, someone, somebody, or some organization has got... And I don't want to turn this to, into just this, you know, grandiose political conversation, but that's really what it is, is has to stand up and say, we can no longer, as a society, continue down this path where we're just going to mask the symptoms, we're going to cover everything up, and when you're the last six months of life or six years of life for some people, it's going to be shitty. Mm -hmm. And we're just comfortable, we're, we're okay with that. We can't, we got to get to the point where we're not. If everybody in pain couldn't vote, You'd see politicians take it serious. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It, but but here's the thing, and and Dan Heath's got a great book called Upstream, and he did a hell of a job with it. And many of the examples in his book are directly at healthcare. Nobody is financially incentivized to fix a problem upstream. Nobody pays for it. Okay, you've got to do it because that's the oath you took. That is the that is the that is the do no harm because if all you'll do is sit there and dispense tape all day long, but you won't tell people why they're leaning on it, or the same thing with a medication, or the same thing with a knee brace, same thing with a back brace, or you're very satisfied selling somebody 120 visits of chiropractic adjustments, you know they'll they'll buy it because it makes them temporarily more comfortable. But the the heroes of of right now are going upstream. They're never going to make more money. They're never going to get patted on the back. But when you go upstream and start having the integrity to fix problems, and you, you're the trainer that develops the relationship with the therapist, you're the therapist that develops the relationship with the tennis and golf pro, you're going upstream. Mm -hmm. And you're helping them do the exact same thing. And nobody's going to pay you for it, and it's not going to change your financial profile in a year. But your integrity goes through the roof in your community. FMS was an upstream thing. It was an irrelevant test till we proved it was, right? It was an inconvenience in the weight room until all of a sudden it got a station at the NFL Combine because it meant something. But everything we find in the FMS is upstream. It's helping you prevent a future problem. So it was a, it was a very, very hard struggle to keep the light on um, at FMS for a while there because people just didn't get it. It was an inconvenience. And we've been sold convenience for 30 years. But going upstream, you're not going to get a medal and you're not going to get more money. Do it anyway. It'll be all right. Uh, you mentioned, you know, convenience. And I think this conversation is both for the professional who, like you said, needs to go upstream, but, you know, also taking some personal responsibility. Um, we found that you know, we have this stat here that 20% of the U.S. population lives in chronic pain. Now, that's them obviously saying that they live in chronic pain. Um, I, I often wonder if it's this the convenience factor to just say, well, I have low back pain. Mm -hmm. I have this. I am in this amount of pain. And so they just self-label themselves. And it becomes part of their identity, right. but it also becomes, I, I, and, I, and I hate to say this, but I've been in healthcare long enough. It's a lot of people's excuse for a lack of success, uh, an accumulation of weight, a very sedentary lifestyle. I am this, and therefore I don't have to do that anymore. And if, if you want that, it's going to be like a rock around your neck. You're going to age quickly, and you're not going to enjoy your last 10 years on the and planet. I think, so. Yeah, great. And I think that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of my point I was trying to make a, a few seconds ago. Is it's, it's, almost become, it's almost become the new norm, is that it's okay to, you know, yeah, everybody else around me has back pain. Yeah, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of the thing. That's just the way it is. And everybody else is overweight. Nobody's working out. And I am, you know, if I want to go out and play golf, I'm going to pop some Advil and I'll be fine. And I think no one, whether it's the professionals listening to us, whether it's the, the local, forget politics, forget the government. The government, we don't want the government in this anyway, right? But we've got to have the hard, hard conversations. We've got to be the ones, as you kind of said, 
at the forefront, the tip of the spear, having the conversations with the people that we're seeing, whether it's the general practitioner who's seen you for a cold that needs to go ahead and say, okay, you came in here because you got a cold and a flu, and I need to give you some medication to help with that. Oh, by the way, you're pretty significantly overweight. If you would drop a few pounds, go do your walking, this cold wouldn't have impacted you near as much. So do that. Yep. That's the conversations that I don't feel professionals are having right now. No, they're not. And, and, and let's, I mean, everybody's got an out. Most GPs got five minutes and they got somebody watching yep. that clock. You got to do what they came in for and give them a little bit of come to Jesus talk about their physical management too. And, and PTs are the same way. The great thing about PTs and chiropractors is we got more time with these people. But I want everybody listening to us that knows our model to hear what I'm saying. You don't have to do an SFMA on intake. You got to do it before you assign any movement remedy. Some people come in post-surgical with steri strips on. I don't need an SFMA to know what to do for somebody post-surgical, but I need an SFMA to know how to organize the exercise stress and corrective moves I'm going to do to get them out of here. But when it's time for them to graduate, when it's time for me to put them back into their lifestyle... I don't just prove an SFMA doesn't hurt them. They go through a movement screen or some type of balance test or something, and guess what? I still catch stuff. But that's what wellness programs and trainers in our community and, and people who understand this are for. I'm, you're not done yet. Your, your episode is over, but you're going to be back if you don't manage this stuff. We'll help you manage it here in a wellness program. Or I know four trainers in the community that will take the ball from here and take it much further down the field than me. And that's all you got to say. That, the, the time it took me to say that is what, what I say to patients. Does everybody listen? No. No, they don't listen. But I said it. And, it's, and, and that's your responsibility. Your responsibility isn't to listen. It's to make them aware of it. And I got a few tests that say you're not normal and you do have risk factors. Do you want to know what to do about that? No, nah, I'm fine. Okay. Then I did my job, right? But, but a lot of people lean in and say, I've been wondering about that. So, yeah. And, and it, this all started back when Lee and I are working in the same hometown we grew up in. And you do see these people have repeat problems. And it, and it really made me feel bad because I thought, hey, you got the Grey Cook stamp of approval. But I wasn't taking the risk factors off the table. I was just getting you out of back spasm. I was just getting your ankle mobbed, but I wasn't fixing the thing. And so, when, you know, you see your mistakes in Walmart, <laughs> right? They come up to you and they're like, oh, my back's still not better than what I thought it was. You know, well, that's because I didn't check enough stuff when you left. And I think the one thing we've been saying, I would say more recently trying to bring this to the forefront, is that awareness factor that if everybody thinks pain is normal, they've lost that awareness. Mm -hmm. Is that part of what the conversation has to be is pain is not normal. It's their signaling something is wrong that you have to fix. Can you fix it yourself? Probably not. Can you take a stab at it? Maybe. But we have to figure out what's creating this uncomfortable situation in your system. Is it as something as simple as, yeah, we need to get a trigger point. We need to foam roll it, stretch you out you'll be all right. But even that trigger point's there telling you something is wrong, and that trigger point, you can't just, foam rolling is a good example. If you're foam rolling every day before a workout, and you've got a foam roll because you think you're going to die if you don't foam roll, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Your workout in your, your training regiment should put you in a position where you don't have to rely on something like that. Yep, and it, you could go on the internet right now and take a sleep survey, and also ask the internet show me the most inflammatory foods on the planet. And if all you did was clean up your sleep hygiene and start removing inflammatory foods from your diet, you might find out the foam roll gets used once a month after a new workout routine or you've added maybe a, a different a different training cycle. Foam roll's not bad, but it, as Lee's saying, if you can't move without it, it ain't your problem, right? Well, that's an interesting angle that we haven't gotten to yet. We talked about medications and obviously that's around inflammation and you have a pain signal. What about, you know, could you go a little bit deeper into inflammatory foods and how yeah. they might cause or Well, right now, up? you know, we invented sugar because if you're running around in the jungle, it's pretty hard to find a big old <laughs> right? Unless you get on a beehive, it's pretty hard to get, you know, a, a big sugar load into you. And refined sugar, 
and even worse, high fructose is an immediate inflammatory signal. We weren't made to have that kind of sugar load. You're walking through the woods, you're lucky to find about seven blueberries at the same time. That's the way it rolls. So we invented sugar and we've become highly addicted to it. We hide it in our coffee, we hide it in our, our favorite foods and stuff like that. And when you see low fat foods, just realize sodium and sugar went up. When you see low sugar foods, just assume bad fats went up. There, we have a natural need to get salt, sugar, and fat into our diet. And we have a natural inclination to rest as much as possible. And marketers have done into that. But dairy, uh, for, for some people at all, and in moderate loads, can create inflammation. And believe it or not, gluten can create inflammation. None of these things are bad. But if you look at the processing that goes into sugar, dairy, and and wheat right now, and then you went back 600 years and looked at what, how we got sugar, how we got milk, it's a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. So these are very inflammatory foods because really they look and taste like food, but they're cardboard, man. And they're, how does that relate to pain? Well, pain and inflammation go together. Yeah. Pain and inflammation go together. So if, all right, let me put it this way. If you wake up every day and your lifestyle has you 60% inflamed, and then you decide to go do something, well, any amount of movement beyond your limits is going to have that inflammatory response. It's just the way muscle tissue, that signal of a little extra stress is what tells you to heal. You can't heal. Do I put out the fire in my gut? Do I put out the fire in my urinary tract infection or do I put out the fire in my uh, impingement? Well, anything that interferes with your gut interferes with the ability to get sugar to your brain. So your brain's like, screw the shoulder, screw the plantar fasciitis, you fix the gut. But you're eating things that irritate your gut every day, so you're in a constant state of inflammation. So, you know, you can't control the air quality outside your house. But if you have allergies, you can sleep in a bedroom with a HEPA filter. So if I can control the air quality eight hours a day, maybe... Uh, pollen season won't knock me down nearly as bad. So you just got to realize what you can control. But but the inflammatory foods um, are highly refined and usually white in color, <laughs> right? So they're, they're definitely once you know. Let's not let's kind of kind of bring it back here, Greg. One, figure out what's causing you to be in the in pain, right? But there are some very simple, and I use the word simple here loosely, simple things that you can do that will help. Mm -hmm. They're not going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. You're still going to need help solving the problem. But what you just described is change your diet. Yep. Try to work on your sleep. Now, if you're in a chronic sense of pain, state of pain, sleep is going to be an issue that, again, do some basic things that can help. And then stay hydrated. Yep. Those are basic things. And then throw, then add in some exercise, some training that are within what what you can do within pain. Meaning... And what I mean by that is just because you're in pain doesn't mean you can't exercise. I think that's another big misconception on the FMS. We, when we say, okay, you have pain in, on your movements, some of your movements cause pain, you got to go get referred. That does not mean you should not be exercising. But there are certain things in your exercise and training that we should avoid until you, you're out of pain. But there's so many other behavioral things that you mentioned earlier that you can do as a your diet, sleep, and again, I, I keep coming back to hydration because I'm I'm still shocked at the conversations I have with just even some of my friends on, on the fact that they don't even drink water. No, no, yeah, I was getting ready to say we know a lot of people. I can't drink water. I got to put something in. I'm like, really? Don't even drink water. Do the coffee. Do some Red Bulls. Get right on the sodas, and they're off and running, and that's it. Yeah. And so the simple things should not be overlooked. They shouldn't. Yeah, um, I actually have a a great pain hydration story. Um, I was interning at a chiropractic office and when I was in college and a woman had come in and it was in our, you know, normal intake forms. Um, if you drink alcohol, smoke or whatever, and then I had added in, you know, hydration, how many glasses of water do you drink a day? And she said, none. And I said, it just took me by surprise. And so she drank sweet tea all day long, come to find out. And I kind of said, she said, well, I don't like the taste of water. And it, maybe it wasn't my place. I was just an intern doing an intake form, but I suggested, I was like, well, maybe after you brush your teeth in the morning, drink a glass of water, it'll be refreshing, the minty flavor or whatever. 
Anyways, long story short, she was coming in for a low back pain, was constantly coming in. It was She was like a chronic patient. And um, turns out I was no longer an intern about six weeks later, and I wasn't seeing her anymore. I saw her six months later around Christmas time, and we ran into each other, and she threw her arms around me and hugged me <laughs> and was like, I've lost 60 pounds. I started drinking water in the morning after I brushed my teeth. My knees started to hurt less when I started to lose the weight. Then all of a sudden, you know, the caffeine, the sugar, et cetera, who knows how, how the trickle down really happened, mm -hmm. but she started exercising because her knees didn't hurt as much. All of a sudden now she's like leading these five K's in the area. And this all happened in, in six to seven months. And it was just that one little suggestion I made and you just never know how you can potentially impact someone. That chiropractor may not be happy with you. I know. I, I, <laughs> well, I actually got in trouble. I, I got in trouble. <laughs> the, the, the cool thing that I often say is usually just following good lifestyle advice. If you've got a pain problem, it probably won't do that, but it sets the stage for you to get better in an appreciable way. And the funny thing is most of the things we just mentioned are absolutely free right? You can drink a little more water. Doesn't hurt your bottom line at all. You can get a little bit better sleep hygiene. It doesn't hurt at all. And you can eat a little bit better foods and it won't hurt at all. And I'm, I tell most people now, when it comes to food and movement, the, the thing that gets us most is we, we focus on volume. I got to cut calories. I got to increase my activity level. If you will just up the quality of your food, your sleep, and your activity, and if you don't know how to do that, ask somebody. But if you will attack the quality of these fundamentals first, you won't have to count calories and you won't need a sleep monitor. You'll just, your body will naturally say, that's a better path. I think we're going to stay here for a while. So most of the, the things you can do to get a less painful lifestyle and drop risk factors are absolutely free decisions you can make every day. Marketing won't ask you to. They will give you comfort and convenience at every turn. Just, it's profit driven. Just, just ignore it. Okay. And, and it'll be fine. But a lot of these decisions are absolutely free and don't cost you more. Sometimes they cost you less. And just to reiterate, I mean, Gray, you know, we're kind of talking about the calls. It doesn't mean you, you have to deal with the pain, right? You have to treat it. Yep. So you got to get the pain off the table. So that's that's the other thing. I don't want people to walk away thinking we're just we're kind of overlooking the fact that the person's in pain to go find out the underlying cause. That's part of what we have to do. Why is a person in pain? But you still have to treat the symptom and make sure that because treating the symptom allows you to do the other things we want to do. Well, let me go back to one of the physicians we worked with early in our career, Dr. Cassidy, and and we had everything from athletes to motor vehicle accidents come to the clinic, and he would give them a limited run of their anti-inflammatory muscle relaxer pain medication. They didn't show up to therapy. He'd cut them off their meds. They'd go into his office screaming and crying that they didn't have meds. He goes, well, you said as long as you're resting, it doesn't hurt. You just couldn't go back to work. I'm sending you to therapy to get your movement back and do this. If you're not going to constructively do this, you don't need, you see what I'm saying? So there was a responsibility attached to, we, we don't want anybody to go through physical therapy any more uncomfortably than they need to. So I'm not denying the fact that medication, I mean, listen, I've had a lot of dental procedures and I'm sure glad I wasn't 200 years ago in Nebraska when I was getting up, right? So we all need to embrace this, but at the exact same time, if I'm going to help you be more comfortable during this, what is your responsibility? right? Because there's a lot of people in a, in a chair right now, now just popping pain pills. If you're in a chair, tell me why you need pain pills, you know? So, so that, that is, there is a responsibility that I think those of us in musculoskeletal medicine from the orthopedist all the way down need to embrace. And so if you're pushing yourself out of a comfort zone through a rehabilitation process, I'll do everything to make you as comfortable as possible. If you just want to be as comfortable as possible in the same toxic lifestyle as you've been in, I don't want to participate in that. I don't want to be told I got to participate in that. Mm -hmm. So, Lee, could you give an example of a causation versus source? Uh, Big toe, low back pain. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say go, going right back <laughs> to my. Circle. I was going to yeah, I was going to go back to my you know ankle. You sprain your ankle, and you know most people are going to hobble around. Most people, let's be honest, don't go seek out a doctor 
for just maybe something they did yep. throughout the day. Like, you know, you, you step off a curb and you tweak your ankle. Well, it hurts a little bit, but you're going to hobble around, take some Advil. A couple of weeks later, you'll be fine. Well, your ankle's not fine. Your ankle's still kind of messed up. And the more active you become on that bad ankle, the more it's going to be a problem somewhere else. Back pain is just a common thing. You know, a person who's got poor thoracic mobility ends up with shoulder pain. Well, the shoulder, the impingement is the result of not being able to move your upper back. So it's those types of scenarios that, again, compensation. You have a limitation somewhere in the body, you're going to compensate somewhere else. And where you compensate is usually the problem that becomes the issue. Um, when you don't use an area of the body, why would it give you a signal that it's hurting? The, you use the area of the body too much, that's going to be the signal that starts to hurt. Right. Yep. So, and, and, and it... It, when you first start doing it this way with a patient, I said my knee hurts. Why are you stretching my hip? Well, see, if you have a battery of tests, like a Y-balance test, a motor control screen, or even just a step up. Um, I, had, I had an athlete uh, a while back who had been on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for six weeks. He had a jumper's knee. The first four weeks of this, he wasn't referred to physical therapy. He was told, quit playing and take this. What's a jumper's knee? Uh, it's just patellar tendonitis. Gotcha. Okay. And, and so he'd been on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory 16-year-old kid for four weeks. He finally goes through another channel, gets referred for physical therapy. And I said, we've got a problem here. He goes, what? I'm like, either the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are no longer working or the source of your pain is an inflammation. And we know that in your upper quad, up here near your hip crease, is a rectus femoris trigger mm -hmm. that refers to your patellar tendon. So we just did a trigger point release. But prior to doing that, I had a box that was almost half his tibial height. I said, step up. He goes, ah, that hurts. So then I released the trigger, and I said, step up on the box. He goes, that didn't hurt. And I'm like, and that had nothing to do with inflammation. So there is a point where you treat it like inflammation, and there's a point where you say, let's stop the insanity and do our job. And, and so I don't know whether the trigger point came first or it was developed as a response to the tendonitis that he may have had. I'm not denying the fact that he had that, but he adopted a full array of quad, knee, ankle, hip, and back behaviors that were now supporting the problem. And so there's a lot of things called referred pain. The problem was now way up in the other end of the muscle near his hip, he was still pointing at the same place that could have very easily been the inflamed area for about five days. So at, at four weeks into a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, you're saying, you either don't have inflammation or this shit ain't working, right? Either way, I had enough logic to move through but, that but, case. But that scenario, Gray, is very, very common because what you did is you, you treated the pain through releasing his trigger point. Mm -hmm. that, that got him back right. If that's all you did... It's a good chance he'd be coming back in with that same trigger point again. Yep. So again, that trigger point's another signal saying, all right, because he didn't have a trigger point on the other side, I'm assuming. Nope. So there was something causing that. So, and what you said is you still had to go investigate and figure out where, where do we go next? What does he now need to do to get himself lined back up or whatever he needs to do so that trigger point doesn't keep You're coming absolutely back. right. Don't, I didn't close the case at that moment. I disproved the previous treatment theory. Closing the case means now that your knee's more comfortable, let's get you through a movement screen. If the kid had had a horrible push-up, I could easily relate core weakness to how you can overload your knees. If the kid couldn't deep squat, I could easily relate ankle mobility to overusing your knees. So I didn't close the case in that moment. I disproved the previous treatment therapy, which said your knee problem's an itis. Itises don't go away because I touch you somewhere else. Itises go away because inflammation is reduced. So I questioned the previous diagnosis, but I didn't close the case. We closed the case by running a movement screen. Twos are better on everything. No serious asymmetries. Can you run? Can you jump? Can you squat? Good. See you later. All right, guys. So today we have a couple questions that uh, have been brought to us by our social media pages. Um, let's start with Gray. Can you talk about the myotatic reflex? Well, it's usually associated with conversations about plyometrics, uh, which is a, a ballistic activity, and it's based on the stretch shortening cycle. And when I was in 
teaching in college before Lee fired me um, because he was the program true director. True story. <laughs> it's a true story. He said, great, do you want to do this anymore? And I'm like, absolutely not. He goes, well, get out of here. Anyway, I was trying to talk to my class about that. And I had a kid who could barely get the ceiling tiles in the classroom. And I said, jump up and try to get that. And then I said, stand up on this chair, drop down, floor is lava, so hit the ground and go. And he easily, boom, knocked one of the ceiling tiles right out. I said, why could you jump higher because the floor and the ceiling are still the same distance apart. They couldn't answer the question. I'm like, because your body weight dropping off the chair gave you a bigger stretch reflex than you could just coiling your legs alone. Two things are happening here. Number one, you've got a spinal cord reflex. And when we tap on your knee and your leg kicks automatically, that's a reflex. So anything that quick stretches your muscle at a very fast pace will give you a rebound. Secondly, your tendons are somewhat elastic. So now I got a bungee cord attached to a reflexive trigger. And the best athletes in the world know how to use that perfectly. And if you'll all just imagine real quickly, right before you see an impressive slam dunk, there's a step before that that's equally impressive. They do a bound land hard on one leg and they can jump way harder off that one leg than they could if they just stood there on one leg and jumped. So they know exactly how to jump before they jump to get that stretch shortening cycle. Now, flash the light on me. I do not. So there's some people who know how to do that, but a good coach can easily train you into it. And when you go back and see us doing skipping with school-age kids, you can go to a D1 track school right now and see people warming up, doing skipping and things like that. And what they're doing is truing that stretch shortening cycle. Two different things, spinal cord reflex plus a good healthy elastic tendon give you both a bungee and nitrous oxide effect when you're doing plyometrics. But too many people jump into plyometrics without realizing how to dose that. Most people who can't jump their body height have no business doing plyometrics and the best place to start is a little bit of jump rope or some skipping and hopping drills so i'll, I'll take a different stab at that because i think a lot of professionals look at or think about it or maybe have investigated it during the stretching of a muscle mm -hmm. right so when you go and stretch a muscle you know if i've got you like most common probably example would be someone laying on their back and stretch your hamstring mm -hmm. well you're going to start stretching your hamstring and you're going to get some resistance that resistance is that reflex saying, ho, oh, oh, ho, you're going too far. And if you hold it there for a number of seconds, 20 seconds, 15 seconds, six seconds is what really takes to release it. Six seconds, it's going to relax. You go a little further, and you're going to get to that same point. That really gets to the point of the fundamentals of P and F stretching mm -hmm. is, is kind of contract, relax to work off that reflex. Yep. And what, what Lee's also saying is I see a lot of people that do that same stretching technique on people who easily are showing you better than normal range of motion. And, and that technique is good for removing abnormal, unnecessarily high tone prior to activity. That's protective tone. So what Lee's talking about is using some of those stain, same reflexes to get through protective tone. But I've seen people doing that same uh, thing when somebody's patella is near their collarbone, and I'm like, nah, yeah. you know. Yeah, I'm not necessarily advocating that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that's it. So when you have high tone, you can use some of those same constituents to, to recalibrate. Um, so Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Lee, I'll take this one to you. What are your thoughts on the ACL injury epidemic? Oh, how long do we have? Um, <laughs> I, I think there's been so much research um, on the ACL, and a lot of it we're, we'll get to. A lot of it we'll talk about everything from femoral angles, Q angles, to um, menstrual cycles in females, to um, lack of mobility in certain areas. Lack of, I think most, most of it goes to lack of motor control. I think it's, it's any and all of that. Um, you get into training, you get into, are we training more now than we used to? That is a, I would say, very, very difficult um, way to answer, itself. yeah, to, to, to be able to answer that question specifically. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of things. I mean, it's like, you know, I think when you start talking about injuries in general, well, what, what, Lee, what do you think causes ankle injuries? Well, 
you know, what do you think causes ACL uh, tears in people? Well, I mean, you could get to diet, you could get to hydration, you could get to, you know, people, I think that's part of the problem. And, and I'll stop and let Gray chime in here. I think people are trying to put one thing on something like that, and you can't. I think you've got to go back, get to the fundamentals. If you want to prevent an ACL injury, tell kids not to do anything. I mean, sit around, because if you're playing a sport, you're, you you got a chance of getting hurt, whether you tear your ACL or not. Are there things you can do leading up to that? I think just go back and read everything we've been saying for 20 years. That's what I'd say try to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it uh, pretty, pretty easy. The minute we got scared about this pandemic, you can't go anywhere. Somebody's not shooting you in the friggin' head with a thermometer. We call that pre-screening. And we're not letting you in this building if you're running a temperature. Since we know we got an ACL epidemic, it is undeniable. What's the pre-screening? Most people just have a program to make your knee potential problem go away. There is no pre-screening. What are you going to see on somebody who's probably getting ready to have an ACL injury, an ankle, a low back injury, or a mechanical injury non-contact? In most cases, you're going to catch them on ankle mobility, serious asymmetry, core weakness, hypermobility, or a bad movement pattern. The, these are things that just scream just like a high temperature. You're not getting this building. So if I've got basketball camp and you flunk your movement screen, I, you can fix that in a week. You can remove a lot of these bad things in about a week. But I'm going to need as much attention on this as you're going to put in your first three days of basketball. So isn't it funny how we've got an epidemic right now and you can't walk around without somebody shooting you with a thermometer? But we've had this ACL epidemic right under the nose of sports medicine, and everybody's trying to fix it with a program instead of just proactive screening. If this is a pandemic, treat it like you treat a pandemic. Let's identify who's at risk and get them the help they need first. And if you can't squat, touch your toes comfortably, if you can't pass a Y balance test, if you can't pass a movement screen, you got a high temperature. I'm not saying you got COVID. I'm saying you ain't getting in the building. You know, how, how long have we been saying that, Gray? 20 years. 20 years. Somebody just now heard it the right way they needed to hear it. But let's quit chasing our tail and quit chasing these anatomical problems because the exact same valgus collapse that causes ACLs, causes low back pain, shin splints, plantar fasciitis, quad tears. Okay, so quit focusing on the anatomy of the problem and focus on the stacked risk factors and behaviors that will give you one of these problems, yeah. and it'll be a surprise to everybody, but it's not a surprise to anybody looking. All right. Uh, this one comes from social media as well. Uh, they have a client who is interested in personal training and a program. However, they have MS. And so they were seeing if maybe you had any advice on how to uh, program for this individual. MS is a, is a uh, autoimmune disease that is going to attack the myelin as you're trying to motor program and organize. So there are multiple ways MS can present. One is progressive. You just get worse every year of your life until it ends. Bad, and, and that's unfortunate. Others have cycles where they are higher functioning and lower functioning. The one thing we know that will create a problem with MS is getting them overheated. So the whole point of the workout has to be way more fundamental. Now, I go developmental here. Um, there are uh, yoga classes that are very MS friendly, but I ain't talking hot yoga and I'm not talking highly strenuous. These people need to go back to the fundamentals of movement, roll, kneel, stand, squat, back down. It needs to be very floor-based because MS patients are already at a predisposed fall risk. So number one from a practical standpoint, they got a little bit better chance of kissing the ground or kissing the floor. 
and they are going to need to know how to get back up in a safe and controlled way. And people who know how to get up and get down off the floor also know how to fall in control. So you can get all of the muscle toning, physical awareness, and signature of balance and movement by going way developmental. And and I don't care whether you're doing stuff on a stability ball or bird dog or whatever, but get creative. And if your MS patients can't get up and down off the floor smoothly, that is the workout and give them some of the help that you can give them right there. If they can already do that, then we do go for a fitness load, but don't try to get the sweat. Don't try to do that because they could very easily rebound in a, in a bad direction. So, so monitor um, a lot of things about the way they're sleeping and hydrating, but keep their exercises fundamental and functional. And if that's not enough, add more reps before you make it more aggressive. All right. Well, thank you very much for for being here today. And thank you for listening and watching potentially on YouTube. Uh, We take questions on social media, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, You can respond to the newsletter as well. We'll take those. So we love to get your questions. Thanks so much for listening and watching. We'll see you next time. That'll do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please take a minute to subscribe and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, be sure to first move well, then move often. Why, thank you, Gout. Why don't you go get some lobster tail and a bourbon? <laughs> I mean, I can't. I'm just really going to figure that out because I can't not Eat drink. Eat salads.